Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick Gard, and with me, as always, are the three people who have spent a large portion of their lives sitting in darkened movie theaters. First, he is the author of Duty, Honor, Empire, a 25th century love story, and the uh, red redding to my Andy Dufresne, Chris Haley. Hey, uh, I know a lot of people. I can get you anything you need. Also with us is a woman who's desperately needed as part of this podcast, the only female presence, something that the Shawshank Redemption was terribly missing, uh, Lori Flores. And, uh, Sorry, I was reading. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I wasn't paying attention. Okay. Hopefully it was something good. I don't know what you said. Uh, you <laughs> said you are the poster to our cell block. <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. I like Rita Hayward. No, you were Cal Welch. <laughs> yeah, which was your favorite poster? Rita Hayward. I, I like Cal Welch. I, Nothing against I would have gone with Rita Hayward, too. <laughs> Matt? Welch. Chris? <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure. I think Rita Hayward is pretty good. All right. Finally, the youngest member of our group and the man who has one of those boyish faces, much like a young Tim Robbins. Matt Palmer. I'm the only guilty one here, and I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everyone. And if you haven't quite figured out, this week we're reviewing, or this, I guess this episode, we're reviewing 1994's classic, I don't know, prison drama, The Shawshank Redemption. I got I think the it's a love story. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is. Uh, I have the summary on this one since it's my pick. Uh, so I will get us going here with this very, very, I don't know, rewarding and and hopeful film. A very special episode of Movie House Memories. <laughs> yeah. After a couple of kids' films in a row, we just had to go a hard right the other direction and go for a hardcore prison drama. Can you tell me a story? Based on the short story by Stephen King entitled Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption, The Shawshank Redemption is a film about believing in hope in a world filled with hopelessness. The film begins in the year 1947, where the quiet and passive banker Andy Dufresne, played by Tim Robbins, is convicted of murdering his wife and her lover. Despite his repeated claims of innocence to the police, the jury, and the judge, he is sentenced to two consecutive life sentences at Shawshank State Penitentiary. Andy begins to impress and surprise many of the inmates at the prison almost immediately upon arriving at Shawshank. One of those he surprises is the prison contraband smuggler Ellis Red Redding, played by Morgan Freeman. Andy befriends Red, who is also serving a life sentence for murder, and requests that Red procure a small rock hammer so that he can carve some small stone chess pieces. Additionally, Andy requests Red get him a large poster of Rita Hayworth, which becomes the first in a long series of girly posters that Andy places in his cell. However, Life in prison is not made up of just chess matches and staring at posters of beautiful women. Andy soon draws the attention of the prison gang, the Sisters, whose leader, Boggs, uses Andy as his own personal sex toy. After a couple of years in prison, Andy overhears the brutal chief guard, Hadley, played by a former Highlander villain, Clancy Brown, complaining about his taxes. Andy informs Hadley about a financial loophole which results in him becoming a personal H&R Block representative for all the prison guards. After Andy suffers a particularly vicious attack by the sisters, Hadley severely beats Boggs, resulting in Boggs being sent to another prison. Andy is now protected and is not attacked again. Soon after, 
Warden Samuel Norton meets with Andy and recognizes the potential of using Andy to cover up some of his illegal financial activities. The warden reassigns Andy to the prison library to assist elderly inmate Brooks Hatlin. As part of his duties, Andy begins writing weekly letters to the state government for funds to improve the understocked library. After a few years working with Andy, Brooks is freed on parole, but finds that he is unable to adjust to the outside world after 50 years in prison. Without hope or an understanding of his place in the free world, Brooks hangs himself. At the same time, Andy receives a large library donation that includes a series of musical records. In a moment of uncharacteristic defiance, Andy plays an album over the public address system, which, which results in Andy receiving a long sentence in solitary confinement. After his release, Andy explains that he holds on to hope as something that the prison cannot take from him. In the mid-1960s, an inmate na named Tommy Williams, played by Gil Bellows, informs Andy that an inmate at another prison claimed responsibility for an identical murder, suggesting Andy's innocence, something that he has claimed throughout the film. Andy approaches the warden with this information, but Norton refuses to listen. The warden places Andy in solitary confinement and has Hadley murder Tommy under the guise of an escape attempt. Andy refuses to continue with the scam, but Norton threatens to destroy the library and take away his protection and preferential treatment. After Andy is released from solitary confinement, he tells Red of his dream of living in a small Mexican coastal town. While Red shrugs it off as being unrealistic, Andy instructs him, should he ever be freed, to visit a specific hay field near Buxton to retrieve a package. Red goes to his cell that night believing that his friend may be contemplating suicide. During the roll call the next day, Andy's cell is found empty by the guards. In an angry rant directed at his guards, the warden throws one of Andy's rocks at the poster of Raquel Welch hanging on the wall. The rock tears through the poster, revealing a tunnel that Andy had dug with his rock hammer over the previous two decades. The film reveals that during the previous night, Andy escaped through the tunnel and the prison sewage system with Norton's ledger containing details of the money laundering. While guards search for him the following morning, Andy, posing as the fictitious Randall Stevens, visits several banks to withdraw the money that he has been laundering for the warden over the last several years. Finally, as a final F you to the warden, he sends the ledger and the evidence of the corruption and murders at Shawshank to a local newspaper. The police arrive at Shawshank and take Hadley into custody while Norton commits suicide to avoid arrest. After serving 40 years and giving up on ever seeing the world as a free man, Red receives parole. Like Brooks, who was released before him, Red struggles to adapt to life outside prison and fears he never will. Remembering his promise to Andy, he visits Buxton and finds a cigar box containing money and a letter asking him to come to Mexico. Red violates his parole and travels to Texas, admitting he finally feels hope. On a beach in Mexico, he finds Andy working on a boat and the two friends are finally happily reunited. And that is the Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. All right, films are not made in the vacuum. They're made in a vacuum. They're affected by the times that they're made in. And we look at back at some of the those highlights in Laurie Forrest's Headlines of the Time. Okay, the year was 1994. Again. Again. This is the second so. time we've done a 1994 film. <laughs> At least it's not 1971. That's true. That was a good year. <laughs> no, terrible things happened in 1971. <laughs> Newt Gingrich was named Speaker of the House. Paula Jones accused then-President Clinton of sexual har harassment dating back to when he was governor of Arkansas. Stephen Breyer was confirmed by the Senate as a Supreme Court Justice. And in the History Repeats Itself section, Russians attacked the secessionist Republic of Chechnya. The predominantly Muslim region had declared independence from Russia three years earlier. Nelson Mandela was elected president of South Africa when his party, the African National Congress, won after the first democratic elections in South Africa. Four were convicted in the World Trade Center bombing of 1993, which killed six people and injured over 100. 
and Patrick, who won the Super Bowl that year. How about them Cowboys? <laughs> yeah, every once in a while they have a good year. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> they had two in a row and then took a year off just to give the other teams a chance. And then won another one from some horrible, horrible team. And I believe that game was played in Arizona. God, what was that horrible team, Lori? I know, I know you know it, but I just can't how remember. Many, how many years are they taking off now? <laughs> well, they got to give the other t- teams a chance from time to time. Okay. That, t- that horrible team, by the way, was the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers, yes. Who have more Super Bowl rings than they do. They the do state. now. <laughs> they do now, yes. Kurt Cobain committed suicide, unfortunately. Grammy winners in 1994 included the Bodyguard soundtrack, I Will Always Love You, performed by Whitney Houston, and the song A Whole New World from Aladdin. And on television, ER and Friends began long runs on NBC. Popular in theaters were Forrest Gump, (laughs) Pulp Fiction, which we have again from 1994, (laughs) go figure, Um, (laughs) Quiz Show, and this week's feature, The Shawshank Redemption. All right. Uh, we begin our reviews usually talking about the cast in the film, and let's start with Tim Robbins, who is is kind of an unusual pick for a hard drama at this particular point in time. He's coming off of uh, the player shortcuts and Bob Roberts, which uh, the player shortcuts are dramas, but he was mainly known for comedy coming out of the '80s. So this is kind of unusual casting. What did you guys think of him in this role? He was good in this role. I'm not a terribly big Tim Robbins fan, but uh, I thought he, uh, I think he is a good actor. I just don't like his style, but I thought he played this part very well. Um, He was, I think he was kind of meant to come off as a little bit arrogant if you didn't know him. And I think that's kind of what, um, I think he definitely gave that air of, I think his presence gave that air of arrogance. So the the uh, character or the actor? Uh, well, a little both, really. <laughs> but uh, but no, I thought he, he was very good for this part. I thought he was wonderful. Um, I haven't seen all of his movies, but I I can't I can only imagine that this is one of the best. I just think he fit the part to a T and that he really portrayed the character. And I always like when I feel like when I'm watching an actor and I kind of look in their eyes and I feel like I know what they're thinking. Um, there's just so much going on in their head, and and I I felt that with his performance. I, I thought he was perfectly cast, it, you know, because Andy's kind of a fish out of water, anyways. So I, I think you need someone that you wouldn't normally expect in this type of movie, and he, he definitely brought that to the role. And then I think he he executed it very very well. You know, it's funny that I I'm not a big fan of Tim Robbins. Tim Robbins. There are films I like that he's in. But this is one of the few films that I could say that I actually thought he acted well in. Most of the time, I feel he's playing Tim Robbins. He just seems to be in the same kind of character each and every time, kind of low key. But I think that's what was necessary for this role. I find it interesting that you found that an arrogance about him because I found nothing arrogant about his character, Chris. I found him overly humble. I, I didn't get a sense of arrogance about him at all that he's almost, I mean, he's literally in this case, a victim of circumstance, but that he just kind of rolls with the punches up until the end of the film when he's finally pushed too far. And he finally says, I've, I'm going to make a break for it. I mean, what did you find arrogant about him? Well, I think it was humble to the point of arrogance, really. Humble to the point of arrogance. (laughs) I think that, um, you know, they kind of uh, gave a line at the beginning when they introduced him that uh, he he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way just because they didn't get to know him. And I think that's kind of what he played. Like, yes, I do agree that he did have a humility about him and a humbleness, but I think that as Laurie said, that he's someone you can see thinking, I think that he played it so that if you didn't know him, you would think that he's thinking that he, that he's a better, that he's better than you when inside he's, he's actually just a very deep thinker. So I think that's kind of what I mean by arrogance that he, he did play it both ways. Okay. Well, you know, I found it very interesting reading about the potential casting of this, that they looked at 
Tom Hanks, Kevin Costner, Tom Cruise, Johnny Depp, Nicolas Cage, and Charlie Sheen. Which one of these things doesn't belong in this category right there? But for Kevin Ke- Costner would have done pretty well, I think. I, I think Kevin Costner could have played it, but I think he would have pl- he would have been much older for the role. I mean, he's yeah. Uh, I think the role almost needs someone who's a lot younger and the, and I think Tim Robbins would have been more appropriate. I found it was interesting that Tom Hanks was considered for it, but chose to do Forrest Gump instead. And Tom Cruise was supposed to, when it was supposed to be a Rob Reiner film, Tom Cruise was supposed to be involved with it coming out of a few good men working with Rob Reiner there. I thought that would have been interesting. Although I, I would have a hard time imagining Tom Cruise in this very subdued role because he doesn't mm-hmm. do subdued. He does big. Yeah, Tom Cruise does not do a bottom and rape scenes. <laughs> the second lead in the film, and he's literally a second lead, is Morgan Freeman. And I found it interesting that his character is supposed to be a middle-aged white man in the original short story by Stephen King. So he plays a middle-aged white man amazingly well. That's what I can say for this. Uh, what did you guys think of him in this role? Well, I, I don't see race, so I didn't notice he wasn't a middle-aged <laughs> white man. Um, I don't see age either. <laughs> <laughs> but At your I, age, Lori, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he played it very, very well. I, I don't know who else I would have cast besides him. I thought everything about it was magnificent. I agree with Matt. I thought I'm a huge Morgan Freeman fan. I just I thought he was brilliant, and he just he has such a coolness about him with um, characters like that. But yet each character is different. I don't feel like I'm just watching Morgan Freeman. Coolness like Samuel L. Jackson coolness or just a relaxed comfort to the way he plays the role? A relaxed comfort to the way he plays the role, but also um, a very toned down Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think the way I see it too is he, he's a, an actor with a lot of confidence in his own ability in a good way and that he's never felt the need to overact. And he had that very subtle portrayal of this character in this movie that I thought was, was perfect. Yeah. All those years as easy reader paid off for him. That's all I got to say. So hey, you guys, (laughs) Chris, what did you think of Morgan Freeman? Yeah, I I liked him a lot. I I like him in most of the parts he plays. I think he's a a really great actor. And I agree. I think he had a certain ease and acceptance of the condition that um, his character was in. And I think he he played this character perfectly. You know, uh, he's my favorite character in the film. It's weird. The audience is almost supposed to see things from Tim Robbins' point of view, is that he's the new guy in the prison. But I almost think it's Morgan Freeman that's the kind of the character of the audience, that this it, calm acceptance of what he is and just describing the world around him. He is the narrator to the story, so that's one of the reasons for it. But unlike Tim Robbins, where we talked about all the other people that were potentially cast in the role, I, and I said I had a hard time imagining somebody but him playing it because I think he played it so well. The other people they considered for Morgan Freeman's role were Clint Eastwood, Harrison Ford, Paul Newman, and Robert Redford. And I could literally see almost any one of them playing the role that Morgan Freeman played and probably playing it just as well. I, I have a lot of respect for those four actors. And I, I think his role was possibly the easier of the two to play not that i'm not trying to take anything away from it i thought he did a phenomenal job with it he he could have he could have played it a completely different way but i thought it was interesting that i could see i I, in my mind's eye i can see clint eastwood in that role i can see paul newman or redford or ford playing that role and playing it with kind of that same kind of confidence what did you guys think about that or i would agree with that and again the four of them have that cool factor in that confidence and and they're good at that aloofness i i i could totally see although i loved morgan freeman and wouldn't want him replaced i could as you said i could see the any of those others in the role i could see clint eastwood doing it well i robert redford seems a little too young and a little too handsome <laughs> um you know i mean i he, i don't think he he could really pull off that uh grizzled hopeless inmate the Han- way that eastwood or freeman could handsome man can't kill a person is that what you're saying a, a handsome man uh would would not be that jaded oh handsome man always has hope is that what your thoughts are yeah that's right 
I think I could see all of them except for Harrison Ford. I don't know why I can't imagine Harrison Ford. Maybe because he always comes off as these very cranky characters in his roles. So I think all the others I could see doing a really good job. Okay. The last person I wanted to talk about is Clancy Brown, who played the chief guard Hadley. This is a character actor that I, you know, I remember as a kid from I, the first time I saw him in a film that I remember was Highlander, and he plays the main bad guy in the Highlander, and he he chews up a lot of scenery in that. But when he came back, when I saw this film, it was the first film in a long time that I'd seen him in when this came out in 94, and I thought he played, the, the it's another villain role, but I thought he played it was such, he played it down so well, and it's very sinister, and he he plays great villains. <laughs> what did you guys think of him? He's a prick, All right. and he does it very well. I thought, I, what I liked about his role is how it kind of, the extent of the character's brutality kind of, it surprised me still. Because there's something about this as a prison movie, it still feels kind of clean, kind of sterile, you know what I mean? It, with some exceptions. But then here's this guy who otherwise looks like a respectable type of person who will literally beat you to death and murder you in cold blood. And I think a lot of that comes from the way he played the role, which fits into the plot of the movie overall. Is You, you ask how they could get away with this for so long. And I think it's because of that the brutality feels out of place. Interesting. Yeah, I I would agree with you. He was he was great at it. I don't recall seeing him in anything else. I never saw Highlander, but um, I, there was such an intense dislike for that character, and you could just see that he just the unremorse and the brutality. I mean, he was a sociopath. And um, yeah, it was he. It was a great character. I think the casting in this entire film, there was nothing that was out of step. No, I would agree. Every every role, including Gil Bellows, who I'm not a big fan of. Yeah, he um, was great. He was great for the part he had to play. And, and the warden. The warden. And, no, the yeah. warden is great, and he's an ass in most films that he plays. That's just kind of the role. But I thought he. He was, he was, he's an, a much more sinister one in this one. Usually I'll talk about the directors when I think it's a director of, you know, large acclaim. And the director of this film is, this is his first film, Frank Darenpont, Darenpont who is not known primarily for directing because he's only directed a couple of films. But this was his first one. What is he known for? He's known for this. He's known for the Green Mile. He was he directed the first episode of The Walking Dead, the television show, and was kind of the the kind of the creative force behind it for the first season, and then ab abruptly left the show in the second season when he had creative problems. But he takes unusual material and adapts it very very well. Uh, you know, I, I put in our little notes of things we're going to talk about. Probably should be the only director should ever be allowed to adapt to Stephen uh, Stephen King's work because he did it so well with this, and then turned around and did it again with The Green Mile, uh, another Stephen King short or not a short story, but actually essentially a novel at that point, but less supernatural. And uh, he does it so well. Granted, those are two prison films, but I think he he takes material and makes it accessible and interesting. Uh, and rather than just horrific, because this could have been a heavy drama with without any kind of uh, uh, without any hope to, at all for the character, even though he followed the story. Um, what did you guys think of the directing style? I mean, or the fact that how he did with this film? I approve. I would never have guessed that it was his first film. I, I it was it just everything fit together so well. And I agree, there's been some really hokey adaptations of Stephen King work, but Stephen King is brilliant, um, the stories he comes up with. So the two of them should work together more. <laughs> yeah, I thought he created a very nice feel for the for the whole prison you know he i noticed he didn't use a whole lot of color in the world and you know it was more drab to reflect the surroundings that they were in so i thought he had a very he set a very good tone for the film and uh, a very good pacing for it i i like yeah i like the direction and, and it it was very similar to the green mile it, it kind of gives the the narrative kind of gives it the ethereal feel a little bit and i think like i said before there's there's something about this is a as a prison movie that 
doesn't feel quite like a. It's totally based in, in reality. I mean, other other than you know a, a couple of a few people, this this prison doesn't look like altogether a worse place to be. And I think he's kind of constructing this movie, you know, about about the prisoners and their relation to the to the crooks very very carefully and very well. What about symbolism, Chris? What's uh, what's the deeper meanings and hidden hidden symbolism in this film? Well, I'm hoping I don't step on Matt's moral universe this week. Of course you are. That's what you do every week. <laughs> yeah. To me, it, the symbolism, it was almost, this film almost came off as these murderers and whatever crimes they did were the actual victims of society and the, and the jail that they created for them. Um, I thought it was a very interesting notion that, uh, you know, they always said, I'm here because my lawyer screwed me over sort of thing. And it never had anything to do with them. And it was almost as if everybody was innocent in, in this jail and forced to forced to do illegal things for the, the prison guards and the, and the warden. And, um, you know, so I, I thought that they were kind of playing off a reverse prison is, is a re reforms you it and it doesn't. Well, I thought it was interesting that most of the prisoners do not come off as threatening other than the sisters. Mm -hmm. And every person who works in the prison, for the prison, like Hadley and the and the uh, warden, are bad guys. And deadly bad guys, as, as the uh, Gil Bellows character eventually found out. So I thought it was a very interesting juxtaposition juxtaposition of the kind of the good guys and bad guys is that you don't tend to think of the people keeping the bad guys in prison as bad guys. No, I, I agree completely with that. Well, I think, I think it's a, a statement on the difference between thieves and crooks. You know, the, the prisoners are thieves or e even murderers, but they're, they're honest criminals for the most part. Whereas the, the prison guys, they're, they're crooks, you know, they're hypocritical, they're, they're exploitative, they're they're the worst of the villains because of of what they did with the role they had to play. I mean, what about the kind of and Matt? If I'm stepping on your moral universe, let me know. But kind of this we've already we've already stepped all over. <laughs> okay, but with uh, heels. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Sorry. not done stepping on it either. Oh, oh. You took my moral universe and you stomped it in the corner of the film room. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I got more. Uh, the kind of the this underlying. <laughs> this hope that Andy hangs on to and is is very precious for him the whole time the fact that he's digging a tunnel the entire time and hangs on to that hope even though he doesn't seem to have I, I don't know want to say like the gumption or the motivation to finally leave until the very end when he wants to get literally when he wants to get revenge on the warden for what he the wrongs that was done to him is that's when he finally you know goes I, I would say I would rephrase that that he um, he uh, didn't go there on his own terms, but he left there on his own terms. Ooh, I like that. I don't think he even did it. My impression of Andy, I don't even think he just did it for himself. I think he did it for all of the prisoners. Oh, I would agree with that. That it, it, that's that's what he's telling you know Red when Red's trying to you know hopes a dangerous thing and he. And eventually he comes up with the line of, you know, get busy living, get busy dying. And, you know, and Andy says, basically his answer is get, get busy living. He's done with this. He's, he's moving on and he's, you know, he's, he's going to give hope to, to the rest of them. And he does literally give hope to Red. Red was going to quit. Red was con also contemplating suicide like Brooks and eventually decides to, not follow the system and violates his parole and heads off to Mexico. Atta boy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think also on that theme is I kind of noticed some uh, uh, kind of an anti uh, religion theme where it was a, it was a rejection of having faith um, because the faith represented in the Bible is what the warden had. And um, it was more an embracing no, he of or he, he didn't have that faith or he wouldn't have treated people like that. That was a well, no, that that's the thought. point. I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I yeah. kind of think that they're saying that, you know, this person of faith, this is how he acted. And then which I suppose with um, Andy, who had hope. So I, I kind of saw it in many ways as as an anti 
as an anti-religion in some in some cases. But hope one. <laughs> but hope one. <laughs> All right, Matt. What about your moral universe problem or portion? Is there anything left? There's there's <laughs> something left. I, I talked about thieves and and crooks, which I think is a big part of this movie. Something else I think a lot about the title of the movie, The Shawshank Redemption, and I think a lot of it's just kind of a snappy title. But, you know, clearly they're pointing us in that direction. Yeah, don't don't say that to Warner Brothers, because that's why they blame this film for not being a sec- success at the box office, because it had a crappy title. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I like the title. I think it's I think it's uh, an attention grabber. It's intriguing. It's intriguing, but it sounds boring because no one can... Pr- pronounce it and that's what was they they contribute to this film not being a box office hit it wasn't a box office hit and it was not a box office hit i did because it didn't have any vampires in it i digress please matt continue so if I, i i asked you know who or what was redeemed in this movie and i don't think it was andy because he didn't need to be redeemed and i don't think it was shawshank or or the crooks because I mean, there's comeuppance there, but I don't think there's redemption. And so I, I think uh, ultimately the redemption in this movie comes through Red's character. And we have that theme of hope that, that's throughout the movie. But I think when he, that point where he becomes uh, redeemed is, is kind of ironically when he abandons hope. And he has that meeting with the parole board where he says, look, I don't care. I feel really bad for what I did, but uh, I have no hope for getting out of here. So leave me alone. And then at that point, they let him go. And then after he leaves, he gets to experience hope again in like a pure way when he goes to meet Andy uh, in Mexico. So I think that the irony is that the the redemption of this movie comes from accepting your fate to the point of abandoning hope. And then at that point, you're allowed to have hope again. I, something similar on that, and that was something I was going to talk about during Chris's section, but I thought I might be stepping on yours, is – Similar to how you just talked about uh, Red, you know, giving up hope and finally reaching redemption at that point in time is that I saw a lot of the characters in this is the the facades of the masks that they wear. Uh, the prisoners throughout the entire film always say, well, I was innocent. Every man in here is innocent. You know, that's kind of the joke, the story. And obviously the warden and the guards are putting on a mass or facade, as Lori kind of pointed out, this whole, you know, he's, he's a, a God-fearing man, the warden, but he doesn't really believe in God with what he's doing, having people killed and stealing money and, and the corruption and threatening people. Obviously, that that's his facade. And it's only when Red goes in, to, or when he goes into all these parole hearings, he tells them what, he, what they want to hear. But that's his mask. And it's only when he finally takes off the mask and says, you know what, you're going to leave me in here. I don't care that they they finally appreciate. They they finally recognize that, you know, this is the true person. This is the man. And then they grant him his freedom. So is I saw a similar along the same lines, except for the redemption is that they finally they finally become who they are and accept who the, their their person is or what they did and what they did wrong and they let their true self show through that that's his redemption i agree with you i think it's red who's redeemed yeah i would say that i i, I agree completely um i don't i can't really imagine anybody else um who is redeemed there's no redemption in the warden that's for certain yeah, I agree. That was well put, Patrick. I, I loved that. And Matt, I, I love that um, he hid his rock tool in the Bible. Because and, the warden won't actually look in there. Right, exactly. It was brilliant. I just I just loved that. I just saw a lot of symbolism in that. And in, in just the, the thing, you know, the, the verses that the warden would spout it out and didn't really mean and. That was Andy calling his bluff for 20 years. Uh, let's talk about the ending of the film. I would safely describe this as a Hollywood ending. Andy escapes, gets to live in Mexico with a boat, and Red gets out of prison, paroled, absconds from parole, and heads off to Mexico, and they live happily ever after. Doesn't generally get any more Hollywood ending than that. Did find it interesting. Uh, the director did not want to film the beach scene. Wanted an ambiguous ending with uh, Red just basically getting on the bus and being hopeful to towards his future, not knowing that if he's going to be reunited with Red. But the studio didn't want that ending and made him film something else. 
What did you guys think of the ending, and would you have preferred Darren Bont's ending better? I liked the ending. I think I, if he, if it had ended with Red on the bus, that's what I would have imagined. I think there was just so much tragedy throughout the film that I needed that ray of sunshine to leave, uh, to feel at peace after watching it. So I, I appreciated the ending. You know, um, I would have been just as satisfied with him getting on the bus and them not, sh- excuse me, and then them not showing what really did happen to him. I would have assumed that he went to Mexico. Uh, The way I saw it though, was he really had nothing to lose. uh, If he, he, if he got on that bus and didn't make it to Mexico, he, he would have violated his parole and got sent back to jail, which is also what he would have been happy with. So um, anything other than him hanging in that room next to, in the same room that Brooks killed himself, I think it was a happy ending for red. That's a good point. So, so you're pissing on mine and Matt's theories of redemption because Red took off to Mexico. You know, he was going to win either way. Is he even going to find Andrew? He was going to go back to prison. Is that yeah? Is that yeah, really? Re- I mean, he had nothing to lose, as far as I'm concerned. But he was. He did find redemption. He found some happiness. Yeah, I, I think we know which one he chose, and that's why he was redeemed. But in the long run, he played it safe because. If he fails, he just gets mm-hmm. caught. I mean, and he was uh, and, com- comfortable in prison, but he wasn't happy. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and the thing that made him one of the things that made him the most unhappy was the warden and the security guard who uh, that were taken out. So, I mean, that's also be careful what you wish for because you and the next person could be even worse. But still, I, I really don't think he had a whole lot to lose, and they could have just ended it with the bus. I think it's the same movie either way, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure it matters which ending they chose because there, everything was pointing us in that direction. You know, the redemption, the hope, blah blah blah. I, I think I, I almost all of us would have assumed if they leave it on the bus that he reunites with Andy. So I like I like the ending. I like the payoff. Sometimes the the Hollywood ending is appropriate, and uh, it was in this case. And I don't think being a little more explicit about it hurt anything. Sorry. It wasn't rushed. It wasn't like a little bow put on at the end to make you feel good like some Hollywood endings. I mean, the whole movie led to this. I would disagree with that a little bit. I don't I, I agree with all of you that I don't think it changes the film. It doesn't. I mean, that's when Red gets on the bus and he's got the little box from uh, Buxton or whatever. He's we know where he's going. And so it's the natural course of thing. It's not a sudden right turn at the very end that every, okay, let's sing a happy song uh, like from the pirate movie or something like that. But I, I don't think it mattered. I agree with like kind of Matt and Lori's point of view. I don't think it matters either way. We know how it was going to end. I do think it is a little like a, a nice little bow on the end that we know that they're reunited, but I'm okay with that. It, it, it was, it's how this film was going to end and how, Three once Andy got out of the prison, I knew how that film was going to how the film was going to end, and I was glad that it was going to end that way. Uh, let's talk about the film's legacy. Nominated for seven Academy Awards in nineteen ninety four nineteen ninety four Academy Awards, won not a single one. <laughs> Nominated for Best Picture, lost to a horrible horrible film called that Forrest was, Gump. That was the year of. That is, yes, yeah. as Lori likes to refer to it as the year. <laughs> <laughs> the year she won the Oscar contest that we have because of Forrest <laughs> frickin' Gump. But Even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> yes, and out of 23 years. Gump isn't that bad. <laughs> uh, it's not as good. Well, nominated for Best Actor for Morgan Freeman, by the way. Uh, lost to Tom Hanks, obviously, for Forrest Gump. Best Adapted Screenplay, uh, Frank Darabont wrote the screenplay. Lost to Forrest Gump. <laughs> Best Cinematography, which I'm actually kind of surprised at this one. I, I, the cinematography is not bad, but I don't find much about it like groundbreaking. It's, uh, it's still a prison film. So Lost to Legends of the Fall. Uh, Best Sound, Lost to Speed. Best editing lost to Forrest Gump, and best score lost to The Lion King. You know, zero for seven. So not a good night for the makers of the Shawshank Redemption. 
AFI list, uh, AFI is 100 years, 100 films. Uh, the first time it came out, uh, the first time AFI did a list, it was nominated, did not make the top 100. The second time when they did the top 100 films 10 years later was ranked number 72. So it's starting to get some attention. AFI is 100 years and 100 cheers, ranked number 23. Uh, 100 years, 100 scores, uh, nominated. 100 years, 100 heroes and villains, The Warden and Andy Dufresne were both nominated. 100 years and 100 movie quotes, nominated. And 100 years and 100 songs, nominated for Dutino Salaria from The Marriage of Figaro, which is the song that Andy Dufresne plays over the speaker system in the middle of the film. Which quotes were nominated? I believe it's uh, Get Busy uh, Living, Get Busy Dying. Okay. Uh, Empire Magazine called it, and, and this is something that can be argued, the best film of the 1990s. Put it on number four on the their 2008 list of 500 greatest films of all time. Put it number four. Um, so high acclaim from Empire Magazine. BBC Radio uh, in England, listeners' greatest film of all time. That was the, what they ranked. Rotten Tomatoes, 90% critics, which is surprising to me, 99% audience. Fans love this film. There's not much, there's, but ironically, there's not much of a legacy about this film. The film made about, about $18 million when its initial release, got nominated for Best Picture, made another 10. So it made about $28 million. Kind of became a slight cult hit on video when it was released on video in 1994, 95, but it wasn't until TNT purchased its, uh, its, uh, broadcast rights in the early two thousands and put it as part of one of their new class or not, or the, one of the new classics is AMC. I mean, maybe I'm getting it wrong. TNT or AMC, one of their new classics, uh, line that, and they run it literally, it seems like every weekend that it becomes a huge, cult favorite and people really start paying attention almost 10 years after the film comes out. What do you think of this film's legacy? I mean, are you surprised that that didn't do well? I, I am surprised because it's a great film, but historically that happens. A lot of times a, um, a film can be lost in the year or I don't uh, know. I'm not saying I agree with the studio, but in the, you know, in the marketing or something, <laughs> But then it's such a great film that it's going to stand the test of time. It's getting played on television and people are watching it. And then there's there's word of mouth. So I, I can I can see how that happens. When did you see first see this film on television? When? Um, 90s or 2000s? Probably 2000s. OK, so you, you're one of the latecomers to it. I'm a latecomer. Yeah. And I was completely shocked because I didn't have an interest in seeing it. It seemed like a dark film and um, caught it on television and now I'll watch it if it's on. It's really good. You might say, Patrick, that a movie's legacy is a little bit like a box of chocolates. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yo, don't tempt me. I'm going to stab you in oh. the neck. <laughs> um, I'm going to be sent to Shawshank. I, I guess in a way I'm surprised because I do think this is a very good movie. In a way I'm not because I don't think this is just a powerhouse of a movie that will necessarily grab everyone's attention so maybe, maybe the critics just kind of didn't pay it the attention it deserved but i can see why it's such a such a fan favorite so i'm not surprised by the legacy i think it deserves a little more though now when did you see it probably on tnt in the year you know 2002 or something like yeah, that so you're a latecomer as well yeah chris you know, I, I kind of agree with this legacy. I can see how it could turn a lot of people off because of the um, the pacing of the story. You know, it is set in, in a prison where they have all the time in the world and the pacing does follow it. So I can see how something like that might turn off a whole lot of people. But I think for uh, the other type of people who appreciate a very good story with deep characters – that uh, that's what draws them in and uh, and why uh, it does have a, a very nice niche and a little cult classic following. So, you know, I, I don't think it will ever grow tremendously from that simply because there aren't a whole lot of one-liners in it or maybe, you know, comedic scenes, but it is uh, a very watchable, a movie that you can watch over and over again. When did you first see it? 
Well, to be honest with you, the first time I've seen it from start to end was for this podcast. I've seen bits and pieces, and I've always known what the story is about. But uh, f- for this podcast, was the whole. Uh, it was the only time I saw the whole thing. Hmm. I- I'm going to disagree with Chris on that. That that's that it's got its little niche audience. I think this is a film that continues to grow in popularity and continues to find a new audience, whether it be because of TNT or AMC or whoever runs it ad nauseum all the time, that it is a film that it, it was ignored at the time. And I don't, and I, I think a lot of it had to do with marketing. It is a prison film and there's no female characters. Therefore, there's not really a female audience. People think prison, they think dreary. They, they, they see a title called Shawshank. And I said, ah, oh, I'm going to go see the, the film about the running retard who drinks Dr. Pepper. Um, that's, that that's was, right. <laughs> you said the R word. I, well, that's what it was running. That's that's the problem. Is running? Okay, he was he, a jogging. He, he, jogging. Sorry, jogging. That was there. I'm sorry, but uh, it was. I. It's hard for me to. We've already talked about Pulp Fiction, one of my all time favorite films, and that coming out the same year as Forrest Gump. That that two films, either one of these films, get win Best Picture over Forrest Gump, and I say, okay, I can understand it, but they're both equally, equally de- deserving of winning that. I I would have been fine with either one. But to have this film shut out at the Academy Awards, and especially like the the, the screenplay, I, I find that one really amazing, other than the fact that they gave it to Forrest Gump because Forrest Gump was going to win everything. It's just, I don't think that the legacy is the deserving of the film, how good this film is, and how not only just long-lasting, but continuing to grow in popularity. I, I see this as a film that maybe somewhere down the road that will be treated like It's a Wonderful Life, Mm-hmm. Not that it's going to be shown every Christmas, just every weekend on uh, AMC, but uh, that the audience just can, it, it keeps finding new members of the audience and the people who see it for the first time begin to appreciate it and like it. That's that's what I think of it. And I was one of the first comers. I actually saw this in the theaters when it came out. So I, I can honestly say that I liked it way back when, and I, I, I've grown to appreciate it more and more each and every single time I watch it. It is a film, obviously, that I like a lot. All right, let's uh, wrap it up and talk about whether we would put each of us would put it in our top 100 films. And uh, we'll go back through alphabetical again. Let's go with Chris. You know, I'm not 100% sure where I would put this film. I think if I put it in my top 100, it would be towards the 90s. I do appreciate tremendously the the, the storytelling of this film. I will tell you that I was a tad bit bored at times in this film just because it is a slow pace. But I think it had to be. I mean, that's the setting that this film was in. So I'm not faulting it because it was poorly written or anything. I, I, I think it just... It's just the nature of the story, and it kind of took me out at certain points. But, you know, I, I like all the acting in this film. Um, I, I just don't think this is a type of story that I'm generally drawn to, a, a prison-type film. I'll, I'll say I'll put it in my top 100, but it, like in the close to, like, 98, 99. Um, I, I'll say that this is not my favorite of the Stephen King adaptations of his stories. I, I still like The Shining and Stand By Me the best. So, Are we potentially going to be seeing those in the top 100 or is nominated for your top 100 at some point in time? Uh, I, I would definitely like to do Sh- Shining, but we did it for LTMR, so um, Stand By Me, maybe uh, Misery. So, Okay. Lori? I would put it in my top 100. Um, and it's not a movie that I didn't walk to the theater to see. It's not in my you know, the type of movies I like to see. But once I saw it, I just fell in love with the, with the story and the characters. And as you said, I appreciate it more every time I see it. Matt? Um, yes, it is in my top 100. Oh, wow. I don't know exactly where. But, you know, in a way, I feel like this this is a a safe movie. You know, he plays, the, the director plays it very conservatively, I think. And um, takes a great story and just executes it. But it, it is just that. So it's in my top 100. Well, obviously in my top 100. I appreciate the slow pace. It, it causes me to pay more attention to the acting, what's going on behind the actor's eyes and what they're doing. 
I, it's like it's very much like a fine wine with me that this one just seems to get better over time and repeated viewings. Uh, it's much like The Searchers, it's a film that I just I, I don't watch a lot, but when I do, it's usually when I catch it on on television, I stop and I'll finish the film wherever it's at because I just enjoy watching it. It's just one of those types of films. And it's an unusual pick. A prison film, a prison drama is a, is, is, is pretty, I would say, difficult to put in here and say, hey, I'm going to watch this over and over again. But I find it just very, very interesting, and I take something different away from it every single time. Not, not you know, like hidden meetings or different plot lines I never detected before like we did with The Searchers, but just that, you know, just how, how the actors approach their craft. And it's, it's one of those films like this one and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, also from the early 90s that I just love to watch, to watch good actors act. And I don't even think Tim Robbins is a good actor, and I think he does a phenomenal job in this film. So I look forward to our next review of Cool Hand Luke, which is also a prison drama chosen by Matt, to talk about the kind of the almost the comparisons of these two films, because I think there's a lot of similarities, but I also like the differences in the films that it's just, you know, happenstance that we happen to choose these two back to back. But I think it will make for some interesting discussion when we review Cool Hand Luke in a couple of weeks. I like Morgan Freeman in that one, too. <laughs> All right. That does it for this week's review of The Shawshank Redemption. Thanks once again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop there. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories on either Facebook or Twitter. You can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts because we're just creating them left and right now. Last week, we had our premiere of the first James Bond episode, Dr. No, the male bonding podcast that Chris and Matt and I have done, uh, sans Lori. Next month... Why? Uh, why, why am I not included? Because <laughs> the show is called Male Bonding. I'm just kidding. i got to listen to that. We talk about chicks, man. Okay. And next month, uh, we're happy to announce that those of you who may have listened to us, Lunchtime Movie Review, the podcast that birthed Chris, myself, and Matt, or as he was known back in those days as Matt the Intern, the uh, into the podcasting world with our movie reviews of the 80s uh, lunchtime movie review is coming back and actually will be on the movie house memories website starting in may and we decided to come back after an 18 month absence with reviewing one of the quintessential 80s films chosen by chris himself chris what was that quintessential 80s film that you chose for the first first episode of lunchtime movie review in 18 months what was that film again it was 1987's biggest pile of turd Surf Nazis must die. All right. Chris, you could have picked any film from the 80s. Maybe any. that's really a movie? I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I wanted to review it. L Lori, I would argue that no, it is not. <laughs> it is not a movie. I thought you were going to say, you know what I thought you were going to say. Oh, there's so many things I could say, but I say that kind of stuff on Lunchtime Movie Review. I try to keep it a little cleaner over here at Movie House. So in addition to the new episodes, we're going to start putting back some of the old episodes uh, that have disappeared from the face or not Facebook, uh, from iTunes. Uh, we're going to put up an, one of the old episodes each month so that you can re-catch some of those that have, hadn't been heard for in a while. And uh, sometime in the future, we, we know uh, Matt, or Matt the intern, will make his return to Lunchtime Movie Review as well when we review a film that he's interested in. I've always wanted to get Lori on there, but she's always afraid of me going blue on her and using the F word, so she does Lori, you have to drop the F bomb at least <laughs> twice if you go on that show. Oh, man, I don't like peer pressure. <laughs> But anyways, lunchtime movie can reviews. Lacey come too? Lacey can come. My wife okay. Lacey, who actually has appeared on an episode of Lunchtime Movie Re Review, will uh, come. But she works bluer than I do. She's got the mouth of a sailor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, we, I think we beat that one to death. <laughs> so, uh, so join us in a couple of weeks uh, when we review Cool Hand Luke, which is Matt's next pick. And that is it for this uh, this episode of Movie House Memories. Until next time, I'm Patrick. I'm Chris, and I'm going back to the grocery store to bag stuff before I commit suicide. Oh, that's depressing. <laughs>
I'm Lori. Good night. I'm Matt. And we'll see you next time at our house. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.